Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City of Alameda Mayor's Town Hall. I'm Sarah Henry, the City's Public Information Officer. Joining us today is Alameda Municipal Power Board President Ann McCormick, Alameda Municipal Power or AMP Assistant General Manager Bob Orbeda, and AMP Assistant General Manager Rebecca Irwin. Please note all participants have been muted. To submit a question for the mayor or for our speakers, please use the chat feature. All of our town halls are recorded and available on the city's website and our YouTube channel. I'd now like to turn today's town hall over to Mayor Marilyn Ezzie Ashcraft. Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome to everyone out there in the audience. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you so much uh, to our special guests from AMP and the Public Utilities Board. Sarah just introduced them. And I am um, so happy that we could put this town hall together today because as we all know, starting, wow, last weekend, that was a pretty wild weekend of um, thunder, just, you know, thunder that shook the house and lightning. And um, unfortunately, in some parts of the state, not very far from us, um, the lightning led to fires. And, um, but there were also impacts, as we know, uh, to our power supply. And so, um, as we all know, we have, a, a, we are fortunate to be one of the cities in California that has our own municipally owned utility company, electric company, but they are part of a larger system. And so we wanted to bring the subject matter experts to you to explain a little bit about how the system works, the system of transmitting electricity um, to our homes and businesses and um, how it works, problems that sometimes arise, what can be done about it, and, um, and also to, to answer questions that you have. So I look forward to getting started and I think that we're going to start with, is it Bob, you're going to start and talk a little bit uh, first about um, uh, Oh, no, Anne, actually. I, I'm going to take that back. We um, are fortunate to have Anne McCormick, who is the president of the Public Utilities Board. So that's a, that's a volunteer board that um, oversees the, um, the, our municipal, AMP, Alameda Municipal Power. And um, I know Anne is also an engineer by profession. She's smart. She's a triathlete. That always impresses me among everything else about me. But anyway, AMP, Anne, will you start and give us a, a, an overview of, of AMP and the PUB? Certainly, it'd be my pleasure. And thank you, Mayor Ashcraft, for inviting me today and uh, for that kind, uh, kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Sarah Henry uh, for her organization of these meetings and all the good work she does uh, on public information for the city on our issues as, as well as others. You know, as Marilyn said, I'm, I'm president of the Public Utilities Board for the city. And I've had the pleasure of serving in that position for many different terms over the years. In fact, I was first appointed in 2000 uh, by Mayor Ralph Aposado. Oh, wow. um, so I can talk a lot about our history, but uh, yeah. most importantly today, uh, we're going to talk about some of our current issues, um, some of the recent uh, issues with the state grid. Um, but I thought I would start with a little bit of background about our public utility. Uh, as Marilyn said, we're a municipally owned utility. Um, a lot of people don't know what that means. In California, we have the large, we call them the IOUs, the invest, investor owned utilities. They are for profit utilities, PGE in the north, SoCal Edison. But there are about 40 cities, uh, 30 to 40, depending on how it's defined that have municipal utilities, and Alameda is very lucky to be one of them. The largest are Los Angeles and Sacramento, and then other cities more our size, like Palo Alto and Roseville and Redding and others. Um, but we are the oldest municipal utility, oldest utility period west of the Mississippi. Um, we talk about that a lot. <laughs> we, um, the first electric streetlights on the west coast we're on Park Street and here in Alameda. We predate PG&E and we have a long history of serving the city. Um, our, our current setup with the Public Utilities Board started in about the 1930s. Um, and we have, uh, we pride ourselves on local control. The large utilities, the for-profit utilities are regulated by the CPUC, that's the California Public Utilities Commission. We are not. 
We have a number of rules that we have to follow that come from the CEC and our state legislature, our governor, um, rules regarding the grid and whatnot, which we're gonna talk about more today. But our decisions on our power supply, our rates, our service are made locally. And that is um, overseen by the Public Utilities Board, uh, which is a five person appointed board. Um, and again, I have the pleasure of serving as the president of that board. Um, I'm in the utilities in industry. I have been for 30 years. I work for municipal and investor on utilities over the years, uh, primarily in the space of clean energy and energy efficiency. Um, but it's really been a pleasure to bring that experience you know, to my position here in the city. Um, our goals are threefold. This, this, is, this really wraps up everything that we do. We provide energy to the city that's affordable, reliable, and clean. And we're not doing our job if all three of those pillars aren't met. As a side note, we provide jobs in the community. We provide revenue back to the city um, that helps fund the general fund and other projects. But our main goals are to our customers, who are all owners of the utilities, um, to provide, again, energy that's clean. Uh, regarding affordable, we're over 20% below surrounding utilities and our rates, no matter how you slice it. Uh, that's only going to improve. I've seen the forecast of uh, what's going on in the investor-owned world. Um, we through a lot of decisions and planning and efficiency are able to provide power at much lower rates across the board. As far as reliable, we're gonna talk about that more today, um, but you know, recent outages included, uh, we have a stellar reliability factor um, on factor, and again, far exceed pg e or surrounded communities. And you know, what I could talk all day about, but won't is clean. <laughs> we, we started back in 2000 uh, building on some good work that had been done then to ensure that all of our contracts, power purchases, and power assets are carbon free. We have been working on that for a long time. Uh, we went through a period of, of selling some of our renewable energy to other companies and cities uh, that needed it to meet compliance. But the upshot is our power is 100% carbon free. Um, and remember, I also said it's reliable and affordable. So <laughs> we've been able to balance those things. So again, I'm happy to talk more about that maybe in another venue or, or answer any of your questions. Um, but th those are our goals. Uh, right now, we have some specific, specific challenges. Um, on top of that foundation, we have to help our community and our city react to COVID. Uh, we've done that a few ways. Um, there's a, a state moratorium, as you might know, on power shutoffs, although I, I believe, and Rebecca can check me, I think we're one of the first utilities in the state to voluntarily commit to not turning anybody's power off during the COVID crisis. Um, we have not raised rates. Um, which is not to say that some of our costs have not been going up. Um, our power supply cost is the main uh, cost that we have to pass along. Um, but we have held rates steady into the next fiscal year. And we have increased our energy discount and energy assistance programs. And there's lots of resources about that um, on the AMP webpage for anybody who's unemployed or has trouble paying their bill we have more resources than ever. Uh, additionally, um, we maintain a fantastic portfolio of energy efficiency programs. So if people are having trouble paying their bills, um, we can help. We can help um, teach businesses and homeowners how to lower their bills overall, or how to understand our rate structures in a way that can help them be advantageous too. Um, the, the really big challenge right now is a coordination with the state grid. Uh, we are intertwined. Uh, we have some local resources, but a lot of our resources are uh, managed out of town. For example, a large supply for us is our geothermal power, which is up in the geysers. And uh, we all know there's a number of wildfires between there and here right now. Um, but either way, even notwithstanding, we are part of a statewide grid 
and we are under the orders and uh, the management of what's called the California ISO, the California Independent System Operator. They manage our grid. So um, I'm going to turn it over here to Barbara Beta shortly, who's going to you know, talk more about how that grid works and what our responsibilities are there. Um, but I, I just wanted to uh, give everybody that overview of some of those advantages of public power. Um, but how we're still, you know, we're still connected. We live in a connected state and we still have responsibilities there. Um, and that's where some of the recent outages with the Cal um, ISO rolling blackouts came and whatnot. So I'll, I'll end my comments there, and, um, but be here throughout to answer questions as we go. Thanks so much, Ann, that was great. And yes, if we can turn it over now to Bob or Beta. Um, Bob, can you give us an overview, help us understand the grid and how we fit into it? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, President McCormick. Um, the state of California has a vast uh, transmission uh, system that's interconnected with the rest of the uh, Western United States. Um, in Northern California, the majority of that transmission system is owned and maintained by PG&E. Um, but then, uh, as President McCormick said, there's an entity out of Folsom that's called the uh, California Independent System Operator, the CAISO or ISO. There's a lot of acronyms uh, that, uh, and uh, other things uh, that uh, they're called. And PG&E owns and maintains those lines. The ISO, what they do is they manage and control the flow of electricity in those lines throughout the whole state. Um, you know, I'm just speaking now of Northern California in the PG&E area. And in essence, what they're trying to do is they're trying to balance supply and demand. So they, they need to keep the supply and demand on a balancing point. So when we for example, issue our schedules, we say we're going to use 100 uh, kilowatt hours and we also have 100 kilowatt hours of supply to, for that uh, usage here in Alameda. Uh, so they're constantly balancing that every five minutes um, and it's a very complex uh, system and a complex market uh, with the ISO. Um, so what happens is, so this, uh, President McCormick mentioned we have a geothermal facility that we use is up in the Geysers area, in uh, Geyserville. And uh, so that unit uh, generates clean power and the electricity is fed into the grid there in the Geyserville. And uh, it flows through the transmission lines um, to Alameda. And you know, one of the analogies I like to use is uh, the transmission lines is like the FedEx truck and the electricity is the packages inside the FedEx truck that gets delivered uh, to Alameda. So that's how the electricity gets here. Now, as it comes into Alameda, Alameda has two locations uh, from PG&E substations where electricity comes in, one off of High Street and one off of the West End by the uh, Webster Street tube. So those two areas, uh, that's where the electricity from PG&E comes in to our two substations, which are then uh, transmitted to uh, Alameda. Now, Alameda owns the distribution system within the city, and that's what we uh, own, maintain, and uh, take care of. Uh, so that's really how, in a high level, how the grid works. And uh, you know, we'll be available for uh, questions on that too. Perfect. Thank you. Um, great analogy. I like that about the FedEx trucks and the packages. Um, the And so then, Rebecca, if you could just um, tag team here and um, talk to us a little bit about the rolling um, outages that occurred this weekend, um, how AMP decides what area of town um, is is going to be first when a rolling blackout or whatever we're calling them rolling outage um, happens can you can you talk a little bit about that because that's certainly what i hear from constituents about absolutely thanks uh, mayor ashcraft um 
So before I talk about this weekend, though, I want to provide a little bit more information about the role of the California Independent System Operator, the Please. ISO. Yeah. Um, the, ISO, the ISO's role, as Bob mentioned, is to constantly balance the energy needs of California consumers with how much energy is being generated. These always have to be in balance. So the ISO plans for times when electricity may be in short supply, and typically they have ample reserves for those times. However, there are times when supply margins are tight, especially mm -hmm. during the summer, when the air conditioning load across the state drives up electricity demand. When that happens, the ISO has a series of alerts they issue, and I think we saw all of these alerts this past week, so these are going to be familiar terms. Um, the first we saw was a flex alert, and this is a call for consumers across California to voluntarily conserve energy. As the situation grows more serious, the ISO has three stages or kind of three levels of emergencies that they can declare. The first is a stage one emergency. And this is the first warning that demand may exceed supply, and there is a very strong need for conservation. From there, we move to a stage two emergency, and that means that conservation alone isn't working, and the ISO may start ordering additional power plants online. From there, we move to the stage three, which is the, the bigger emergency, and that's when supply is not meeting demand on the grid and load shedding is imminent. So what that means at this stage, all utilities in the state are being ordered to begin rolling outages to protect the stability of the grid. So now rolling outages across the state, these are temporary outages. Um, utilities shut down power to specific circuits for a period of time. They bring that circuit back up and then they move to the next circuit and, and shut it down. And they keep doing this rotation until the ISO says that it's the, the emergency has passed and you can bring everybody back up online. So in 2001, during the energy crisis, uh, AMP established protocols for rotating outages. Uh, load is dropped here in Alameda. We do it for one hour per one circuit at a time. Other uh, utilities may do two-hour rotating outages, but we do them for one hour here. Um, these, these circuits, uh, we, chose, we choose circuits. We don't choose geographical locations. And so there are roughly 13 distribution circuits in, Al in Alameda. And we have designated three circuits with critical load that we strive not to drop in emergencies. Uh, we do everything we can to save those circuits. And those circuits include the hospital, city hall, the emergency operations center, the police department, the fire department, and any other critical infrastructure. So that leaves us with 10 circuits. And we start with the circuit at the top of the list. And once power to that circuit has been dropped, that circuit moves to the bottom of the list and won't be dropped again until all other nine circuits have, had, have been dropped. And so that brings me to last Friday. Uh, sometime late in the afternoon a week ago, the ISO issued a stage two emergency. Now this isn't uncommon during heat waves that happens. However, around 6.45 p.m., the ISO, the ISO issued a stage three emergency and all utilities in the state were ordered to begin shedding load immediately. Now understand that a stage three emergency has not happened in the state of California for more than 19 years. So it's been a very long time. Um, the first circuit that AMP dropped comprised portions of the west side near Encinal High School uh, that represented approximately five megawatts of load and 3,500 customers. Circuits serving the mid island area were teed up to be dropped next, followed by the east end and then Bay Farm. By 7.50 p.m. last Friday, the grid had stabilized and AMP, along with the rest of the state, was notified that rolling outages were no longer needed. And so due to the short emergency of, short duration of the emergency, AMP shed only one circuit on Friday night and did not have to move to the next circuit. So we know that customers in the West End were frustrated because they did not receive advance warning. Uh, unfortunately, AMP, like all other utilities in the state, we receive no advance warning. When we're told to shed load, we have to do it immediately. We cannot pause to get notifications out first. It has to go immediately when we're instructed. So things did get better over the next several days. Um, as the heat wave continued, um, there were still emergency alerts going out for the next several days, but the ISO gave us much more notice. And so we were able to provide customers in Alameda with much more notice. And you saw that throughout the next several days. 
through Facebook, through Twitter, through uh, the city's AC alert system, through the city's web pages, through police and fire. All of us work together to get the communications out to the city. Um, and we, would, we did not see any more stage three alerts. We did come close, but we never saw any more. So um, we were pretty pleased with that. So that's kind of what happened. We're out of, um, we're out of the red right now. The flex alerts have all been called off. Um, by Tuesday and Wednesday, the conservation messages were strong across the state and people were pulling back on the energy use and we were able to get everything back under control and the temperatures have come down. So. Um and that's um, that's all good news, but I do think while this may be, did you say the first time in 19 years that a stage three emergency had been declared, I have to think that with global warming and the trend in which that's going, um, it might not be another 19 years until we see um, a stage three uh, situation again. So if just to um, help me understand, so uh, I understand the concept of the different circuits. Now that the the circuit in the West End was the one that started first with the rolling blackout, if this has to be done again, you will go to the second circuit on the list, not back to the, the West End? Okay. Yeah, that was, so that was a yes, said, yeah. Yeah, it's been 19 years. Um, I will freely admit the staff that were here 19 years ago are mostly gone. <laughs> so it's a whole new a whole new crew here. Um, but yes, with that list, um, what will happen next is the Mid-Island is the first, is tapped to be uh, next. And so uh, the West End won't see it again until we've gone all the way through those other nine circuits. Okay. And then um, what, um, what about people who may need power for, say, medical assistive devices, whether it's, um, you know, powering a wheelchair or some other, you know, life-saving life or life-enhancing um, uh, item. What, how, how does AMP look out for their needs? So with customers that we know about who have medical needs, I mean, as a utility, we can't guarantee power. Um, outages can happen at any time from mylar balloons, squirrels, birds, many different things. So when we know that somebody has a medical issue, we do advise them that they should have some kind of backup generation. There's smaller batteries that they can get. Um, for things like that, they really should consider investing in um, some sort of backup generation. And is that information on your website? Flag two, we know the medical yeah. issue. So yeah, we do offer, so this is where we try to get out more of the word. So we do offer a medical discount to customers who are using uh, extra electricity for, um, for life-saving kind of things. Uh, it's a 10% discount off of their, their energy bill. Um, when we know that they have uh, a life, an issue like that, we do flag them in our system. They are flagged. My concern is that not enough customers let us know. And so there are customers out there. We have a couple hundred on that medical list, but if they don't tell us, we don't know. And so how, how can they tell you? Uh, absolutely. They should definitely uh, come to AMP's website and look for the medical discount and enroll through that, and that way we can flag them in our system and we know who they are. And knowing the amazing Sarah Henry, I'll bet you she's going to put that information up in the chat. Uh, box very soon because I that's a, that's a great um, that's a great reminder um, for your customers um, and just speaking of mylar balloons Rebecca um, we had a, a power outage um, in the east end the weekend before last and and I as I understand a mylar balloon was involved can you talk a little bit about that and do's and don'ts uh, sure, I'll let Bob. Or Bob, whoever, sure. yeah. yeah. Sure, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, Sarah, I, I think that Ann wanted to oh. comment, uh, but I think she's muted right now. Um, right. She's yeah, unmuted, I, yeah. I, I'm back, thank you. Hi, Ann. Uh, yeah, I do I appreciate that question about the Mylar balloon outage, so, so let's go to that. Um, but I did want to react to one thing that you said, Marilyn, uh, about you know, more power outages to come. And, and we certainly, you know, we share that, that concern, um, certainly with the wildfires and everything going on. Um, I, I do 
want to say that a lot is going on at the state level. Uh, there has been tremendous pressure from our governor uh, to bring on more emergency supplies, to reevaluate some of the thresholds that were hit um, by the ISO, and to um, even look at out-of-state resources and whatnot to harden our grid, so to speak. So, you know, we, we certainly don't have a crystal ball on this, um, but, you know, Alameda was not alone uh, suffering through this last weekend. There were, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers shut down throughout the state. So clearly this got a lot of attention as well. Um, so we're doing our part, but there are other larger mitigating factors going on to avoid it moving forward. But yeah, back to your other question. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but, but wait, well, we've got you. So one of the sure. things um, that I was, was reading a, um, an article recently about what happened over the weekend and, and questions were raised about, um, is this an indication that we don't have enough renewable energy sources in California? Does it mean we need more storage capacity? Does, um, does the independent system operator, um, do they, they must in some manner be able to um, forecast needs and anticipate and and what kinds of reserves are out there and that was a multi-part question but yeah uh, <laughs> if, yeah and a, but a really good question and you know uh, these are issues um you know as you uh, mentioned at the top that we will be talking about at our public utilities board meeting oh, so I tell us when that is yeah, and how exactly. could <laughs> if you don't have enough zoom meetings on your schedule please <laughs> join us never enough zoom meetings <laughs> Uh, we meet the third Monday. Uh, I believe we're doing six o'clock now, um, usually in person, usually at City Hall, but of course we're in the little box format right now. Um, th this issue is, um, you know, is being highlighted on our agenda. We will take public comment and we will discuss as a board our role in helping mitigate this moving forward. Uh, it's very complicated, as the mayor alluded to, um, but all of those issues, um, I, I will say, um, there are enough resources, our renewable resources contribute uh, to our ability, but having grid resiliency, uh, having storage, having local generation, and all of those capacity distributed resources versus central power resources, uh, these are all part of state policy and AMP policy moving forward, uh, but there, these recent issues just underscore our commitment uh, to doing that as quickly and as cost effectively as possible. Um, so we'll be discussing that further. Um, again, all good questions and I, I do have to say that the, uh, the firestorms um, and you know, the climate change induced issues, I just make this more important than ever. So we appreciate everybody's interest and input as we navigate it. Thank you. And tell us again the date of that next PUB meeting. Uh, the next one is September 21st. September 21st. Um, we have, I, I think we're, I'm sure we're on the city calendar, um, but you can always go to Alameda Municipal Powers website. There's a public utilities board section. Uh, we do have, um, it's a, you know, a full, a full noticed meeting. We do have plenty of opportunity uh, for public comment, either on agendized issues, which we can discuss, or non-agendized issues, which we take input uh, for future discussion. Um, but we welcome, we welcome everyone there. Great, thank you. Um, and then Mylar Balloons, uh, who wanted to touch on Mylar Balloons? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that one, uh, Madam Mayor. <laughs> okay. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday evening at approximately 7.15 p.m., uh, there was an outage uh, east of Broadway um, is, and it, that affected approximately 200 customers. And uh, there was a, mylar balloons were the cause of the outage in the lines. Um, power re was restored approximately 12.30 p.m. that evening. Um, so it was a somewhat lengthy outage. Um, so, so and when you say mylar balloons were involved, so they got, um, they apparently got loose and, and floated up and struck a power line? Yes, the mylar balloons, uh, yeah, they, they, they got caught up in our, in our power lines and uh, that caused the outage. Um, so, um, we typically, I, I know uh, Rebecca in the flash, uh, 
puts out notices about mylar balloons and uh, they're, they're not good uh, for power lines uh, um, but uh, we understand them but uh, you know uh, the need for them but uh, it's not uh, one of our uh, favorite things uh, in yeah. the utility. I, I, I'm with you. I think they, they look really great and all that, but uh, on balance, um, it's the, there's a lot of um, bad outcomes that could happen, especially when they get loose. Um, yes. So I did hear from a number of customers after that outage, and one of the, um, the criticisms was that it was very difficult to get information from AMP in real time about um, when they could expect um, uh, the problem to be rectified. And so um, I, I know, um, I think some, some changes maybe in um, the way that communications are done around an outage have been, uh, been started. Does anyone, how, how should, if someone has a, um, uh, you know, there's a power outage in their, in their neighborhood, should they go online? What should they do? Yeah, so kind of have two issues. So with the communication side, one thing we know that customers do get frustrated when they call uh, AMP and uh, they can't talk to somebody. So over the weekend, we have only one person here and they're, they're staffing our system operations center, but it's one person and they're here 24 seven, but they can't answer every phone call. And so we just, we don't have the resources to individually respond to every customer. So what they do is they have an automated system that they can move the phones to and what that, so customers will call and they'll get a recording that just says, we're aware of the outage and we're working to fix it. But we, we don't have time or the resources to go much beyond that. Um, otherwise from there, um, the communication, probably the best way to stay up to date on things to, uh, to visit our Facebook, Twitter, or website. Uh, we put most of our outage information up there. Um, you can, rep we don't encourage people to report outages through those um, just because they're they're not manned 24 seven. We, we jump on them. If it's after hours, we jump on them when we learn of the outage. But um, we typically know when outages are with the, the smart meter system that we have in place in Alameda. We're aware of outages pretty quickly. Um, and so we, we know that, but as far as the communications, um, I would encourage folks to visit our Twitter site our Facebook site uh, and our website. And we keep smaller outages there. If it is a larger outage that's going to affect thousands of people, uh, we work with Sarah Henry, who does a great job helping us get it out on AC Alert and through other channels. But for smaller outages, uh, we keep it more just to the Facebook, Twitter, and AMP website. But can customers expect um, information in real time um, as opposed to hours? Uh, well, so there's kind of two different er uh, issues there. So this one, um, the communications, I think, were there. Um, we, if you want to move into the other issue, we had a, a more difficult time getting uh, a response to the outage. And I think that's probably where customers got frustrated. So I'll let Bob kind of talk a little bit more about that part. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't need to go too much into that because I'm Sarah's telling me that we've got um, uh, questions coming up. And so maybe some of our listeners will even be asking that. But real quickly, whoever wants to take this, um, what are the kinds of things that Alamedans can do to save energy, um, to minimize their electricity usage in general, which will just, you know, help uh, put less stress on um, on the system and um, are, are some good practices. Who wants to, um, well, to offer up? I'll, and I'll jump in with something yeah. that's maybe not intuitive. Uh, the, the stress on the grid really happens during the late afternoon um, into sunset and early evening. Uh, that's when our load is the highest um, in Alameda and in the rest of the state as well. So um, to the degree that you can manage your appliances, not charge your car, um, keep lights off as long as possible. We have so much solar on the grid in both Alameda and Northern California in general, uh, that you know we used to peak, not our city didn't, but most of the state used to peak when that air conditioning was the highest mm -hmm. at three or four in the afternoon. Now the peak's at seven or eight. Um, so to the degree that you can shift your energy use uh, later in the day, um, you know that, that's really helpful, particularly in these grid um, emergencies. The other thing you can do is just make your house as efficient as possible. And, 
I could talk about that all day too, um, but I'll refer you give to- us a, Give us a few quick tips though. Um, replace your refrigerator if you bought it before 1990. Uh, make sure all your lamps are LED and cover your windows when it's hot outside. Perfect. And I'll just throw in one of my favorite energy saving tips that I also enjoy is I have clotheslines in my backyard. And so when I'm doing laundry um, and the weather's nice, my clothes are hanging out there and my linens and things. And they, um, okay, I'm not going to hang them out today. Uh, I do laundry on the weekend. I hope it's not smoky all weekend because I don't want my laundry to smell like smoke. But otherwise, they dry well, you're not using your dryer, they smell great, and you're saving energy. So um, thank you for all that good information. And let's go to Sarah now, who is going to toss questions at us. What have you got, Sarah? Great. Thanks. I've got a bunch. Um, but if anybody else has additional questions, you can enter them through the chat or I'm monitoring the Facebook Live. You can enter your questions there as well. Um, the first one is back to the rolling blackouts that we saw and the list of circuits and just why is there a specific reason that the rolling that the, the West End is at the top of the list and it moves east? Um, is, is there a reason for that West End being at the top of the list there? Rebecca, did you um, want to take that? <laughs> I will be honest with you. Want, I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, there are 10 circuits, um, and the list that we have, um, you know, it's, it's been 19 years. There are 10 circuits, and when the system operators made that decision on Friday night, no one expected a stage three emergency. And they went with the first circuit. Um, it matched. Rebecca, that, that wasn't the question. I believe that the question was, why is it that the, that the order in which circuits are shut down moves west to east? And uh, is that, are you saying that was a longstanding decision made years ago by the PUB? No, I, I think, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, um, the, the engineering and operations groups looks at the electrical circuits. And, um, and uh, when they came up with the list, uh, they didn't look at geographical area, but they looked at, okay, this, air, th this circuit can reduce four megawatts, for example. And that's how they uh, did the list. Uh, um, there was no, there was no um, uh, bias towards any uh, geographic area. They just looked at it like from an electrical design, which circuit uh, could take which loads, and that's how they did it. Okay. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Well, you know, it's, can I, I will can I jump in on that. I, I just want to say there was, yeah. there was certainly no intention whatsoever. Um, that it disproportionately impact one end of the island or another. Um, our circuits are numbered, and, and to my knowledge, it was a, a random place to start, and that circuit will not be called upon until the rest of the island cycles through, um, less those you know, critical um, police department, hospital circuits, and whatnot. Uh, so the next neighborhood on call is mine, uh, west of Sherman, uh, between Sherman and Ninth, sort of mid-island. Um, and then we'll cycle through from there. Um, so I, you know, certainly regret any uh, appearances of intentions or starting on the West End or any equity issues. I live on the West End. I take that very personally. Um, but in this case, it was it was nothing more than the way the circuits are are numbered, and it all happened very quickly. Uh, but we do, you know, we we hear the concern loud and clear, and appreciate the feedback. And this will help us inform, you know, as we make these decisions in the future. Thank you. Okay. The next question sure. is um, somebody asking, how do they do, how do they find out which circuit they're in? Uh, ah. so I'll, I'll add that um, I, I think Rebecca um, provided this information uh, over the weekend. We don't. We don't advertise our, our circuit maps. Um, as you can imagine, it's confidential information. Se it's security, security information. yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we don't want people to know where the Coast Guard is, you know, whatnot. Um, so um, we do, we have put out, and uh, Sarah can probably link to it, uh, the next three circuits as they will come up, um, you know, with just, as I said, mine is uh, west of Sherman and east of 9th Street and, and whatnot. Um, to give people a pretty good idea. So if your circuit is on that list, we will provide a general information, um, but our, our maps of the system are confidential. And um, I would also just add that maybe someone just wants to throw in a quick little reminder about 
we should all be prepared for, sometimes it's not a rolling blackout, it's a, a blackout all over. And I don't know, the way things have been going in California lately, I just am never sure what is next, but what are the kinds of things that, that our residents um, and, and businesses, but should just have on hand to make sure that they can stay safe and um, functioning if the power goes out? Who wants well, to take that? You want I, to go I, in? Yeah. I, yeah, I will say, I think that's, that's a great point. And, you know, we still have earthquakes and fires and, and other issues going on. So, um, you know, I don't know that we were ready to talk fully about emergency preparedness today, but that's a great topic, um, probably for another Zoom. Um, if we have the planned outages, it will be for one hour. And that is typically enough time for your freezer to be okay and, and those types of things. Uh, but when in a real emergency, you know, it's, it's the standard list of, of keeping your devices charged, having, having cell phone, um, having flashlights, having ice and, and those types of things. But I think it goes along with uh, emergency preparedness for any event. And uh, it's probably, you know, a good reminder for all of us to think about that as the mayor said. And, and also, I would encourage um, everyone who hasn't done so already, enroll in a CERT, that's a Community Emergency Response Team training, get, get to, um, to know what you should be doing, get training, it'll help make not only you and your family, but your neighborhood and your, um, your community safer. So go online and uh, look up CERT. Okay, Sarah, what else? Uh, next question is, um, who regulates the ISO? <laughs> ISO is regulated by a board of governors who are appointed by the by our governor. Okay. Um, and then um, is AMP looking at distributed generation? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think you want to you tell know, us what that what that term means? Then? Well, distributed generation means local resources, whether we call them behind the meter, which is on the customer side, or in front of the meter, which is what we provide. Yeah. yeah. Um, so DEGs, distributed energy generation, whatnot, um, you know, have always been part of our strategic plan, but frankly, at least in my opinion, uh, and I should be really clear, I'm speaking today as one member of the Public Utilities Board. We're a five-member board and we make policy by consensus and, and, and through a public process. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, distributed energy resources are more important than ever. Um, we, we've seen it in the Climate Action Plan. We've seen it in our need for local generation and, and grid resiliency. Now, that doesn't mean just rooftop solar. That's a lot of the first thing that people think about, which frankly is not the most cost effective. Um, but there, there's other ways um, through community solar projects and through some local generation solar projects that we have um, just getting ready to begin um, now. Um, we, we love our green resources outside of this outside of Alameda um, but having a balance with local generation is really important and, and that and this isn't just Alameda this this is everybody's For everyone thinking yeah. this way in California and beyond. Thank you. The next question is also a bit as about solar. Um, is AMP incentivizing battery backups for solar installations? Yes. Something yeah, that would allow do. homes to run off of their solar in the event that the grid runs down. Yeah, that's a tricky one. And so when we have solar interconnected to a safe and resilient grid, the solar goes into our grid and then actually comes back to your house. It's not the same electrons. <laughs> um, so being able to stand alone and be islanded with your rooftop solar is actually very complicated and not very safe. Um, so you would have to be disconnected from the grid to do that. So I, I won't get into too many of the technical issues and I, I will say it's a common question that people have because it's not intuitive. Why can't I just run off my solar panels? Um, but, but battery backup will help. And we do have incentives for battery, um, battery backup panels. Um, frankly, we've got some great early adopters in Alameda who are putting these in, uh, but frankly, it's very expensive, but we expect that to change over time. We saw the price of solar come down about tenfold, and we expect that uh, storage will uh, follow a similar trajectory moving forward. Um, but being independent of the grid is kind of tricky. And how, where do you, I, I get solar panels, where would you put a battery backup? Are they also... Um, yeah, it's usually like on the wall of your garage, if you've heard okay. of the Tesla Power Wall. Yeah, um, yep. Yeah, um, 
I believe they can be outside under the proper enclosures and okay. whatnot too. Um, if you go by um, sites with battery storage, they kind of look like big refrigerators sitting outside on a, on a oh. pallet. So okay. they're, they're not pretty. Yeah, <laughs> but but their use is pretty. Okay, yeah. good. So so you've got some incentives for people who want to do that. Okay, check that website, people. Sarah, what else do we have? Yep. So the next one is was t thinking about the smart meters that you spoke about. Is there a way to use the smart meters or any other technology? This person says they appreciate the AC alerts and all of that, but what about using our meters to tell a customer when there's a pending outage? Hmm. Rebecca, do you want to take that? Um, the, I don't know how we would communicate through the meter. Um, we're looking at some other kind of like outage management systems. Um, they're kind of outage communication systems that would directly text message to, um, mm -hmm. to customers. Uh, smart meters themselves, are, it's not a bi-directional way that we could communicate. There's no communications mechanism through them. Through, with a smart meter, we can remotely turn you on or off, but th there's not a communications component to that it would be a separate uh, like outage communication system that would rely on text messaging. So you're looking, you say AMP is looking at doing something like that? Yeah, it's the way the industry is going um, and okay. it's something that's on our kind of, of map for, for looking at to, to bring that into the system. And will that be discussed at the September 21st PUB meeting? I know this is, it's a separate issue. Okay, yeah, Bob, please. Madam Mayor, if I can just add to that, uh, as part of the strategic plan, um, embedded in it is uh, what we call an IT plan, an information technology plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have one, and it's being refreshed right now. And uh, that's going to come back to the board uh, sometime in December or January. And as part of that, uh, the, 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 we're investigating the, the, this outage management plan. Uh, that uh, Rebecca's uh, uh, talking about. So it will be coming back to the public, the public utilities board, but probably not until the December, January timeframe. Okay. Okay, everybody who wants to follow PUV meetings to keep an eye on their, um, on their agendas, which you do, um, you can access from the city's website. You can see the upcoming meetings. Sarah, what else? Yep, so somebody asked, will the city require future homes to require a design that's more sustainable with energy, including water, like a LEED design? Um, I think we have been updating our building codes and um, I know for city owned, I think this one has been approved. Oh, and maybe you know that I believe on city owned property, we would require new residential to be all electric. Is that Correct. Rebecca's? I, I believe city-owned buildings. City-owned buildings. Um, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, what, what Marilyn's alluding to is, and, and I believe the question is about codes. Um, mm -hmm. There are two levels of codes, um, the, of course, the state level and then local reach codes. And there are um, some good local reach codes that have been passed um, regarding natural gas and city buildings and others that are in consideration. Again, part of the climate action plan. Right. Um, AMP contributes to these efforts. This isn't our jurisdiction to be very clear. <laughs> We're talking about planning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, we provide a lot of the technical analysis and the policy analysis and things that inform these codes. And um, there's something called Title 24 that anybody who's uh, done a project or uh, major renovation has knows at least a little bit about um, and it's the state codes for construction and frankly they're getting more and more aggressive as they should be and they do require are requiring zero net energy where you have enough of that self-generation or solar to offset your energy use um, the other hot topic, again, for another webinar is, is natural gas use, which is after transportation, uh, the pg e gas usage in Alameda is our highest uh, carbon contributor. Um, mm -hmm. And as we said, our, our energy grid is clean. So while we never want people to use more energy that they don't need, we'd rather your new water heaters are fueled by clean energy than gas. Um, we have a heat pump water heater incentive as well. Um, so those, those types of shifts will continue to be going on in new construction. Um, but yeah, the, the city, to my knowledge, um, is looking closely at additional reach codes. I will also say we're in very good company here. And I, I think this is the perfect um, type of thing for Alameda to be a fast follower and watch what other leading cities are doing and kind of jump on that bandwagon rather than do invented here things and, and break new ground on those. 
fit. Yeah, I like the term fast follower. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, um, very good. Thank you. That was great. Some people have talked about needing help fronting the initial cost of solar. Are there specific programs for that? Yeah, um, the, the real answer is not anymore as far as um, upfront solar costs. Um, we had rebates as high as 250 a watt um, 20 years ago when I put solar on my roof, um, but it cost 10 times as much as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that the um, maybe the amortized of, by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we remember our power is really affordable, and now I'm not even saving carbon because the power uh, you plug into is carbon free. Um, the virtue but, is its own reward. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, solar costs have come down. We do have um, uh, rates which we will buy back excess solar power. Um, from users at, a, at a, a very fair wholesale rate. Um, so there are incentives there through rates. But um, I, I will say, you know, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of good reasons people put solar on their house, but um, you will probably save more carbon by investing in a good used electric car, uh, which we have rebates for, or replacing your appliances or, or doing other pro uh, heat pump water heaters, things like that. Not to discourage anyone from putting in solar, um, but one reason we're not incentivizing it is it doesn't, well, nobody is right now, frankly, because the costs have come down so much. It doesn't save carbon in Alameda. Um, the next person just has a clarifying question. Um, they're asking, um, does AMP buy power from PG&E and then sell it to Alameda residents? No, we don't. Uh, we have our own resources. Uh, as I said, we're 100% green. Um, we have a, a, a breakdown. Um, some of it's a little confusing on our website because of the way we have to report it. Uh, but we're primarily geothermal. We have landfill gas projects. I talked early in the introduction about starting in the year 2000 and really doubling down on renewable power. And uh, that's when we signed our wind contracts, um, our landfill gas projects, um, which is waste, waste methane. Um, and um, geothermal, also hydro, um, mm -hmm. a large percentage of hydro, which fluctuates depending on drought conditions. Um, so yeah, we do not buy power from PG&E. Um, we use their or transmission lines to get it to those island points that Bob talked about at the top. Um, and we own 100% um, of our system within Alameda. Great. Um, the next person says that they know that AMP had nothing to do with the 50,000 gallons of raw sewage that was dumped into the estuary last weekend, mm -hmm. but this did impact the community. How can we avoid this during rolling blackouts and are there fines for this type of disaster? Yeah, I'm going to defer on that one. I, I'm not familiar um, with what eBay mud had to do or why. Maybe yeah. knows uh, about it. You know, that is a good reminder. I have been meaning to check in with our um, East Bay mud uh, representative um, who, who represents Alameda on the board. I, um, I was chagrined, um, to say the least, when I, when I read about that. Um, so, and Bob and Rebecca, if you... Um, if you have any further, I think that's that's an East Bay mud um, issue. I yeah, that's a that's a good question. I will look into that. The, the one thing I will add um, yes is yeah. you know as Rebecca um, described our situation, it was very extreme and very fast. And I suspect that's what led to something that drastic. I suspect with some planning and better notice, it would have been avoidable. But I, I'm just guessing on that. Great. Um, I know we're getting close to time. The last two All questions right. um, were related to um, the alerts and the notifications. The first one talks about Friday. Um, they said they didn't hear about the stage two before it went to stage three, and so they were wondering about that. And then the second question um, said that their power went out at 726 on Friday, but they didn't get the AC alert until 802 or 804 mm -hmm. after their power was restored mm -hmm. at 802. And I can answer the second one to just say that when we send the AC alerts, they're rolling. And so you might get yours 10 minutes after your neighbor gets theirs. And so there's definitely a, a lag sometimes for folks with regards to AC alerts. Um, but with regards to the first one and the notification about stage two versus stage three. I think we'll let Rebecca. Rebecca, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I will, will fully admit, um, we don't normally, up until now, we haven't done a whole lot with stage two to report it because it had been 19 years since we'd moved to stage three. You get a little complacent. That's not the best answer, I know. But um, because it's stage two, the Kaiser, the ISO has been able to pull us back for 19 years. It was something that, I've, that doesn't sound good, but you, we got a little complacent on. 
So what are we gonna, what are we doing differently going forward? If if you can talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, this was a good reminder um, that you know we need to be on that more and and reporting that out more. And I think we can do more um, from our end um, in our newsletters and communications that go out to customers to help them understand the alert system that we talked about earlier. You know, beginning with the flex alert through the three stages. I think we can do more to educate customers about what these stages mean, and then to communicate them out. I, I will totally admit we have not done much communication on that. Um, it's We've been a little bit too complacent, and I think this was a good wake-up call that this is articles that we need to bring back into uh, AMP's communication so we can educate customers. And then when there is a stage two, people understand what it is when they start seeing it in their, their social media feeds and everything else. Right. And I, I don't know about other people. I'm one of those who pays my bills online. So... In fact, it's automatically paid, so I don't actually see the flash. I suppose I could go on the website um, and get it. So I just, I wouldn't want you to just rely on the flash to um, inform customers because uh, I would imagine a number of people do what I do and just have their bills auto paid. Um, I know we have other channels to communicate as well. Okay. It would be broad across multiple yeah. channels. And Anne, you look like you wanted to. Did you want to add well, something to that? Yeah, I would yeah. just say we could always do better with communication. Um, we, we appreciate all of Sarah's work, you know, with AMP. And we'll, you know, continue to encourage our staff to use the city's channels as well. I think the Flash is a fascinating newsletter, but I know a lot of people don't get it um, regularly. It's it, it goes out in our bills. It's, it's also on the website. And I think we put it out on Twitter and whatnot. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of competition for your eyeballs right now. And, a lot and, of competition <laughs> for these eyeballs, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. we always have more to do with, with public information. And uh, I, I think we need to make sure that we don't count on our own channels at AMP, but we utilize all the city channels as effectively as possible. Um, too. And I will say, I always enjoy reading it when I see it. Um, if it's something that you like email, I would, I would read the email, but right. I just um, might not think to go into the website to look for it. Sure. Um, but sure. yeah, that's, we just want to inform as many people as possible. Sarah, we, we can okay. squeeze in a, another couple well, of questions, maybe? Somebody, well, somebody recommended that also if folks are looking, they can go to the Cal ISO website um, themselves too, and that that has oh. the information about the daily load. It has all of the current alerts and things like that. So that's also a, a, a good resource. We have yeah. such smart can, residents, can, yeah. Well, if, and you can get an app on your phone and, and, and whatnot. I, I think that takes a lot of commitment to go to that level, so I really applaud that <laughs> comment. <laughs> um, Mayor, the last question is not related to AMP at all, uh, but okay. it's directed to you. Regarding uh, rent ordinance 3250, is it possible to revisit it and amend it due to the financial burden that most renters are experiencing? Um, and. Yeah, I, we are. That That is going to be yep. coming before the city council. The answer is, short answer, yes. Great. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so I, I never um, miss an opportunity to just remind everyone we are the reason we're meeting um, via Zoom, although it's been a great opportunity, really, to communicate with residents. But it is because we are in a shelter-in-place uh, order from our public health officer. Um, we're starting to do a little better in Alameda County, but it's going to take a lot of concerted effort to get our numbers down to the point when our schools can reopen again for in-person learning. So please continue to do those things that you know you've heard me say a million times, and I will keep saying, when you're out and about, you must have a mask on, period, full stop. You must stay six feet away from people who aren't in your household. And that means when you're waiting in line to pick up your takeout dinner, because we want you to support our local restaurants, uh, or waiting in line to go into the grocery store, or whatever, six feet apart, wash your hands frequently. Um, don't do the things you're not supposed to do, like cutting the tape and the play structures at the playground. This is meant to keep you safe. And please, 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 when you go to our parks, when you go to the beach, if you bring your lunch to enjoy while you're sitting on the beach six feet from the next person who's not related to you, um, only removing your mask to eat, please pick up your trash and take it with you. Um, it's like they say with backpacking, you pack it in, you pack it out. No one's coming to pick up after you. Use the trash cans. If they are full, take that sack home that you purchased and consumed the contents of and throw it in your own garbage can. Our beach and our streets are not 
the garbage can. And so that's the way we can all enjoy these wonderful resources that are out here. We can get our exercise and fresh air, but we can protect our environment too and each other. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our guests. You were fabulous, so informative. We learned a lot and um, we're going to work hard to save energy, take care, stay safe. Um, lovely to see you. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Amp and, and, and it was great. Pleasure. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Great job. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.